Welcome back to Forensic Bytes. Today we're discussing ninhydrin as a chemical means of visualising latent fingerprints. What we're going to cover is the chemistry of ninhydrin, how ninhydrin is actually applied to evidence, what evidence it's applicable for, and why the use of ninhydrin has been phased down in recent years. So the basics of ninhydrin is that it's reactive towards amines. These are nitrogen-containing functional groups, and they comprise about half the structure of amino acids, which are secreted in sweat and transferred whenever you touch an object. The reactivity of ninhydrin as a molecule derives from it having three adjacent ketone groups. So these ketone groups are shown here, with a ketone being this carbon to oxygen group. They are reactive because the oxygen atom is electronegative, and it steals the electrons away from the carbon, making it slightly positively charged. And this effect gets amplified when ketones are stacked next to one another. So this carbon is slightly positively charged, this one's slightly positively charged, whereas the central one is most electropositive because its electrons are being stolen in this direction, in this direction, and down here in this direction. So this central ketone is so reactive that it will spontaneously react with water if it's present. This gives rise to a geminal diol, which is the functional group shown here. And when a geminal diol forms, it breaks the conjugation between the ketone groups. So here, all the ketones are linked together, and this is actually a coloured form of ninhydrin. But once this gem diol forms, the ketones are no longer linked together. So this form of ninhydrin is colourless. Focusing on the colourless form of ninhydrin, this is reactive towards the amine groups of amino acids. Now, as I mentioned, amino acids are present in sweat, and they are also present on your finger pads. So whenever you touch a surface, amino acids are transferred wherever the ridges make contact. So the amine group of amino acids react with the gem diol group of ninhydrin, displacing two molecules of water. If we have a look, I've colour-coded some of the atoms just so you can see where they migrate to throughout the reaction. And when these two are combined, they form this first intermediate form. So the amine functional group of the amino acid is present here, and we can see that it's kicked out two molecules of water. So what we have is two molecules combining together to give three molecules. So this is thermodynamically favoured, and it's a spontaneous reaction. Now, focusing on this first intermediate form, under mildly acidic conditions, so we've added a proton at this point, the intermediate will further react, falling apart with the movement of the electrons shown here, to liberate a single molecule of carbon dioxide. So starting from the intermediate, we get degradation down to this step, where we lose a molecule of CO2, and this is lost from the reaction as a gas, so there's no going back once that's formed. It's released into the atmosphere. And that leaves you with this intermediate, shown here. And it has an unstable functional group, which is shown in the dashed box. Now, because it's unstable in the presence of water, it will liberate a molecule of aldehyde. And what we wind up with is an amine derivative of ninhydrin, shown here. This brings us to the final step of the reaction of ninhydrin, and that's when that amine derivative reacts with a second equivalent of ninhydrin, shown over here, and this results in the loss of two molecules of water, and we wind up with this final conjugated form of rumen's purple, and it comprises one molecule of ninhydrin, one molecule of ninhydrin, and just the amine group derived from the amino acid. And this is entirely linked together, so it's a conjugated system, and that gives you a vibrant purple colour. And so what that means is wherever amino acid was present, if you spray this reagent down, you will get this breakdown of the amino acid and linking together of ninhydrin to give you this bright purple dye. Whereas if there's no amino acid present, the ninhydrin will simply sit on the surface and it's colourless, so it generates a great deal of contrast, depending on whether or not amino acid was present on the surface in that location or not. And this is how fingerprints are visualised chemically using ninhydrin.
In a forensic context, ninhydrin is most commonly applied to surfaces as a spray. The main components of that spray are ninhydrin, unsurprisingly, acetic acid because you need a mildly acidic environment to drive the reaction, as well as the solvent that those reagents exist in. That solvent needs to be volatile because we want it to evaporate as quickly as possible. The reason for that is we're forming a dye, and if the solvent and the dye are present together for a long period of time, the dye is going to run. You can think about it in terms of writing with ink on paper, and if the paper gets wet, your writing is going to blur together. The same can happen to fingerprints. There is an optional final step where you would apply a zinc chloride post-treatment, and what this does is you form a metal complex with rumen's purple and you change its colour from purple to orange. That can be useful if you don't get a lot of contrast with the purple colour on whatever the colour of the background surface is. And the orange complex is also fluorescent, but it requires cooling to liquid nitrogen temperatures, so it's not often used for that reason. In terms of the types of evidence that ninhydrin is typically applied to, it's generally applied to porous materials. So paper, receipts, paper currency, that's what's being used in your country. It can also be applied to the insides of disposable gloves. If they are left at a crime scene, what that can do is can actually develop the ridge details on the inside of the gloves where your hand was in contact with the glove material. So why is ninhydrin being phased down? Well, there have been multiple studies now that have shown that ninhydrin is a less sensitive reagent than some other fingerprint amino acid targeting chemicals, particularly in Dane Dione, which is the -the state-of-the-art spray used instead of ninhydrin. That said, ninhydrin is still used in sequence with other reagents because this leads to the discovery of more fingerprints overall on the evidence. So if we have a look over here, We can see that with the first step, with one of the reagents called DFO, that will generate 240 fingerprints. But if you then apply ninhydrin afterwards, you'll see an additional 86 fingerprints in this study. Indangdione is the -the state-of-the-art reagent used today. It generated 402 fingerprints, but if you applied ninhydrin afterwards, you get an additional 78 fingerprints on top of that. So there's still value to applying ninhydrin to items of evidence after you've done the first round of visualisation with the better reagents. One thing of note is that ninhydrin is thought to be a carcinogen, meaning it causes cancer, so there are some safety concerns associated with using it. So to conclude, the chemistry of ninhydrin is typical of amino acid targeting reagents used in fingerprint visualisation. And because of that, if you understand the chemistry of ninhydrin, you can use that knowledge to design better reagents. Ninhydrin is sprayed on porous surfaces to visualise fingerprints, but it's less sensitive than some other reagents, such as indane dione. It remains useful, though, because when it's used in sequence with some of these other methods, you get more fingerprints visualised overall. That's all we have for you today. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe.